This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. As we end the century, the identity of one of the most influential and forceful countries of the last millennium, our own, is subject to scrutiny, doubt and criticism. What is England now, or do I mean Britain? When did it act as England and not Britain, or the UK, or the British Isles? And how does this new role fit in with the idea of the nation-state, which has dominated the internal and, more dramatically, the external behaviour of many powerful countries over the last few centuries? Yet, despite its mighty past, the nation-state itself can now seem powerless against the forces of globalisation. To discuss this, I'm joined by Norman Davis, Emeritus Professor at London University, whose massive book, uh, Europe, A History, was a well-deserved and great success. He takes up the story of our country, our isles, with an equally impressive and fascinating book called The Isles, A History. I'm also joined by Andrew Marr, former Ed Divin Independent and author of Ruling Britannia, The Failure and Future of British Democracy. He's just finished a BBC TV series, The Day Britain Died. That'll come out in January. Let's try to divide the programme into two parts. First of all, talking about our national story and then the nation's state. Norman Davies, what are the founding stories of British inhabitation and the creation of the nation of Britain? Uh, I see you assume that there is a British nation to begin with. Um, well, I'm trying to provoke... <laughs> I'm trying to, to crack this nut yes. b- b- rather than making an entire meal of it. I know well, that's, that occupies a lot of your introduction. Indeed, but the, the, the BBC sent out instructions this year in a brochure called The Changing UK not to use the word nation in, in connection with, with the United Kingdom. Uh, you're not supposed to be doing this, Melvin. <laughs> um, and there are people... The, the, the Oxford Companion to British History starts off by saying there may have been a British state. There's never been a British nation. There's a complete conceptual morass here about Britishness, the British nation, the English nation, which is something which came much earlier, the Scottish nation, uh, the Irish nation, the Welsh nation... Uh, I personally, the United Kingdom, the British Army. I believe uh, there is a British nation. It was fostered uh, in the context of the British Empire. It is now in very serious decline. Uh, there's always a competition uh, about uh, uh, na- nationhood. Um, in this country, in these isles, there's a competition between the state-backed British nation... Uh, and the popular grassroot nations in um, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and very soon in England as well. So uh, I'd still come back to my original question, because the answer mm. uh, uh, t- took us on a little bit further than I wanted. Never mind, that's not important. Do you think that this British nation has any deep founding uh, myths behind it? Do you think it, it reaches back in any way more than... Uh, pre the empire, do you think it reaches back in the Isles? Your book, you mention a 12th century account of the founding of Britain, where Brute is supposed to arrive from the Battle of Troy. Uh, we know about the British from when the Romans come. And so, is there any reaching back to that in the idea of Britishness, or is that all not only past but forgotten and irrelevant? Uh, I think that all that is forgotten and re- irrelevant. There was, of course, an ancient Britain, and at various stages, the English, who took over the former Britannia the Roman province of Britannia, and they eventually renamed it England, they attempted to legitimise themselves by harking back to King Arthur and and the ancient British. That was almost dead. There was a a second round of that in the 18th century, but that is not really the origin of modern Britishness at all. Andrew Ma, what's your uh, view of this? Do you, do you think there's a morass is as, as sticky and treacly as, as Norman uh, presents it? I may say that in his book, he, uh, well, you can't unravel a morass, but he clarifies it uh, <laughs> he, he much more. He picks his way he, through the morass his way very, very morass. neatly. I don't think he can pick your way through a morass either. Never mind, whatever he does with the morass. He does the morass. He does the morass. through the morass. Not, um, not much of a morass when he's finished. Well, I, I mean, I do agree with that. I think that um, it, it's perfectly clear, first of all, that um, there is a difference. Um, for almost everybody living on the, uh, in these isles, uh, between the idea of Britain, which is a kind of official, um, public, uh, political definition that we're used to in terms of empire and, uh, and institutions of state and so on, and what people feel in their hearts. I, mean, I was very, very strong. I was taught to be British, really, when I was a kid. 
um, in a Scottish school. People are not taught to be British in that sense anymore. Um, very, very few people in Scotland would identify themselves as British first. They'd say they were Scots. And I think the interesting thing at the moment is increasingly that's the case in England too. People are talking about Englishness. I'm English, I feel English. And it's partly... Well, even more local, even I'm... Uh, Lancashire in the case of Norman, uh, Cumbria in the case of myself. Well, one, one of the, the big questions here, of course, I think uh, opened by Norman Davis's book, um, is, is what is England itself? You know, how far back does this roll back uh, come? You know, you lose the empire, the inner empire of, of Wales and, and Scotland begin to go, and then you find in England there is, a, there is quite a big imaginative difference between the southern home counties English, the old Wessex English in a sense, mm -hmm. and the, the Dane law. Um, I mean, you're from the Dane law, um, and, and there is, there is a, there's a different texture to the north of England and the south. Um, I'm trying to get it, because this, this book is, is such a magnificent history, and uh, uh, I, I just want, although you're saying the history is the first stage of the rocket in a way, it's dropped off. Could we just take it back for a second? If we can't, we'll move on to something else. When the Romans eventually colonised Britannia, they, there were four parts. There was the free area north of Hadrian's Wall. There was the unoccupied, more or less, mm -hmm. by the Romans, era. There was the occupied lowland south and east, and there was a militarised zone of the north and west. Now, do you think those far, four parts still somehow linger with us now? Do they still help to define us now? I think they do, and there was also the island of Ireland. Well, that's where what the I said. Yes, the, the Romans never got that's to That's what all. I said, era, uh, unoccupied. Uh, I, 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 yeah. yes. Um, uh, certainly that there's a big difference between the uh, Highland Britain and Lowland Britain. They followed uh, very different routes, both in what became England and what became in Scotland. Scotland itself was seriously divided between the Lowlands and the Highlands. And still is. Well, up to, up to well, a point. Well, the, yeah. the Lowlanders, of course, brought in the English in the 18th century to put down these uh, Highlanders. They couldn't cope with themselves. But, it, the, yes, those divisions which you can see uh, in the early centuries of the, the first millennium have never completely died away. Do you see a real continuity? I mean, you've just written this, you've taken the thing through, you've dwelt on it for years. Do you see continuity applying to uh, political and day, almost daily behaviour? I'm just fascinated by the idea. Is If what the Romans did, we're still... That butter mark goes right <laughs> through for centuries. Do you see it really going through? Or are, are you just being a sort of historical uh, narrator who likes the idea that it goes through because it makes nice patterns? No, there are some elements of con continuity, one of which is ge ge geographical. You talked about highlands and lowlands. Uh, that, that's true. But I think one of the four or five great myths of British history uh, concerns... Continuity, uh, this myth that uh, nothing in these islands has really changed. Uh, you can still go on calling everything England because uh, Eng there are more English people than anything else. In fact, uh, the, uh, the state in which we live has been transformed time and time again. Uh, the United Kingdom as at present uh, was set up in 1922. It changed radically in 1801 when they took in uh, uh, Ireland. Uh, the British state itself only goes back to 1707 when uh, England uh, was united with Scotland and Scotland with England. Um, so um, I'm not a great admirer of the myth of continuity, although some things, such as the existence of the Channel, the insular nature of the Isles, the Highlands and the Lowlands, these things haven't changed. There, for some time, there's been, there seems to have been, there seems to be, uh, the idea that British values are synonymous with English values. How do you unravel that, Andrew Marr? Well, um, if, if you look at what is distinctively British rather than English or anything else, then you look at clearly the, hist the 300 years of Britishness. So you look at things like empire and you look at war. Um, but coming much closer to home, I think that for most people alive today, the core facts of Britishness uh, were really the Second World War, um, our sort of um, myths in the, in, in the non-pejorative sense are the Battle of Britain, the Blitz, that was, that Dunkirk. Was, yeah, that um, wasn't a myth. I mean, no, the Battle no, of Britain was, happened. And it, well, indeed, I said in the non pejorative but, but those, the, those, are the found, those are, as it yeah. were, the modern founding stories yes. of, of whatever Britishness is, plus the welfare state. Um, and what happened after the war in the sense that there was a new uh, dispensation. Now, one of the interesting things, of course, is so much of that itself has come um, under assault um, through the European Union. We are now bound to the countries that we spent so many hundreds of years uh, identifying ourselves against. 
um, you know, for a very, very long period of time. And this is the famous Linda Colley point. This was the Protestant island defining itself against the great Catholic empires of the continent. Mm -hmm. Now, with the end of that, um, we've also seen um, a very radical uh, uh, demolishing and privatising of the traditional welfare mm -hmm. state. So that aspect of Britishness um, is under assault too. And I just, ev everywhere I look around and I say, what, if, if you ask, what are the core British values now that hold us together above all else? It's very, very hard. You can say there's a British economy up to a point. And you see people uh, like Gordon Bryant, Chancellor, trying to redefine the great British society, but it is an uphill struggle. The, would I, you say, no, sorry, uh, uh, just no, no, to add one? Uh, there are 17 sections actually on <laughs> factors of Britishness, but uh, Andrew mentioned I think the most important ones, except of course the monarchy, uh, which is now in great disrepute. Uh, uh, is it? But, think it's in great disrepute? Uh, I've no doubt at all that it is. Um, the uh, Protestant ascendancy, um, this country, whether you, the United Kingdom or England is no longer a Protestant country, and yet that was a bedrock of Britishness. Absolutely. Uh, more, more, I think you said you more, more Muslims than Methodists. In well, yeah. <laughs> No, in, 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 Britain, in Britain as a whole, yes. more Muslims yeah. than Methodists. Uh, sea power uh, has completely eva uh, evaporated. The empire, uh, and I could go on. The seven, if you analyse this Britishness and the pillars on which it was built, all of them have either gone or are crumbling. Do you think that the fact that we're, uh, we are devolving uh, into Scotland and Wales and one hopes a much more independent Ireland uh, is, is actually a rather cunning, instinctive, uh, self-preserving way to continue? Uh, I'm sure the strategy uh, behind devolution is to preserve the United Kingdom, uh, but it is 20 or 30 years too late. If that had um, been instituted in the 1970s, when uh, there was this report, whenever in 1973, um, but then voted down in the re referenda, if it had happened then, then we would be in a much healthier state. The United Kingdom would be. Um, but I, th I, I fear that devolution has come uh, too little, too late, and too unequal. It's a very serious thing that, that Wales doesn't have the same powers as Scotland, that Northern Ireland has a different uh, um, per, um, remit than uh, the But there's Scotland. also, I mean, there's the great yawning question of the English. Absolutely. Um, you know, that seems to me to be the biggest inequality of it all. And yes. this totally unresolved question as to whether the English can be somehow dealt with, with regional assemblies, mm -hmm. which I personally doubt, or whether England now has... Uh, clearly the right, mm. but it's the time for England to step mm. up with her own parliament. I know this, is, this, is, this has to be elliptical, but never mind. Let's take what uh, Andrew said a moment or two ago about the Battle of Britain, which was actually, can, you can say, uh, m slightly more English than British, if you want to play it that way, but never mind. The, the, the Battle of Britain and the, uh, the winning or the staying through were the only country that started and finished the war, and we did stand alone, and these things can be too easily dismissed, and it wasn't all that long ago. And then the formation of the welfare state with, uh, and the great British affection for the welfare state. A lot of values which came out of that. Now, are you saying, Norman, that that, that was one more resurrection of Britishness? Are uh, you saying that? And if, A, are you saying that? And B, are you saying, but already, a mere 50 years on, that has been eroded, and we are no longer, we don't no longer have that Britishness as a rock to build on. Uh, I, I am saying that the Battle of Britain was a, a great re-injection of British consciousness. Uh, I'm also saying that uh, consciousness of the Second World War is eroding for all sorts of reasons, uh, among, one, among many, that, that children are no longer taught about these things in school. It is remarkable, uh, isn't it? I thought it amazing that you should say the Battle of Britain was more English than, uh, than British. Uh, it, it took place largely over England. Actually, the photograph, uh, which is in the illustrations I chose, was, was of, a, of a Polish spitfire. Uh, the Polish Air Force was a critical element in the, in the, in the winning of the Battle of Britain, uh, almost I mean, what, totally forgotten. Yeah, but, I mean, it was, and I'm, I'm not, not uh, dismissing it in the slightest, but the, the percentage of Polish pilots was, I would have thought... Ten percent. Ten percent. And the, the, the pilot that shot the, down the largest number of German planes was a Czech. Um, so, yes, they, that was, in a way, a European 
uh, obviously, the, the, the Royal Air Force was a British force. It wasn't an English uh, Air Force. Uh, um, it happened over... The Nevertheless, the idea is... I mean, the problem with this is slightly rushing. It one, no, I, I, I would like to argue that mm -hmm. at length about, with you about that, but I think it's slightly more English than British, but that's for another occasion. Now, <laughs> because what I'm trying to get at is that there was, a, a, you yourself said, a kind of re energizing of the idea of Britain in the Second World War, taking it from Andrew said, what, I, what Andrew said, and what I'd like to know is, do you think that has petered out or do you think it's being overwhelmed? Or we, we have to reinvent it again. I mean, that's, you know, there, there is clearly a difference between the Britain that was ruled by the wartime gen and immediately post-war generation who took very different lessons out of the war. I mean, I'm very, very struck by the fact that our most um, vivid nationalist speaker, as it were, at the moment, is still Margaret Thatcher. And she's the one who talks about Winston mm -hmm. uh, as if they were close friends. And yet it was Churchill who took out of the war, like Willie Whitelaw and Heath and many other people, a very strong sense of the need for some kind of more European Union and closer European destiny. You, you, the Battle of Britain was, of course, the... Uh, the great moment of a war, and Britishness was built, among other things, on mm. war. And we Constant don't... War. Mm. Not only do we not want more such wars, we couldn't afford to fight another major war. That's all in the past. We can't count on another Battle of Britain to, to bolster... Uh, our, I mean, our identity. The great staging posts are wars, aren't they, of the last millennium, Absolutely. if you look at them, yes, from 1066 to 1939, we're looking at... But once the British Empire gets going, I mean, if you actually you know, run through all the wars from the kind of the Seven Years' Wars to the Ashanti Wars to the Imperial, is unbelievable and largely forgotten um, saga of war year after year, decade after decade, it goes on and on and on. One of the most uh, things that I'd love to have talked about is the depressing thing about this largely forgotten that you keep saying, and you keep saying, Norman, almost wholly untaught. Um, history, the fact that history is being erased from uh, the curriculum is... Uh, well, apart from Norman Davies, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> sitting here, and always, when you look around for, for big narrative histories mm. that give you the whole story of something or other, there are very few of them around at the moment. Can I just ask, Norman, why do you think England seems to have so much more of a problem seeing itself as, as a country, and let's say in relation to Europe, just to use this as an example, than Scotland do or the Republic of Ireland or one assumes when it gets cracking Wales? Uh, I assume Wales is cracking yes. now, I'm absolutely so. <laughs> I, think, I think the root of the problem is that England, from an early stage, was an imperial power, first of all, within the Isles, the conquest of Ireland in the 12th century, the conquest of Wales in the 13th century, the union with, with Scotland on rather un unequal terms in the 18th century, um, the English establishment, uh, as it was, the, the, the United Kingdom was run predominantly by English people, not exclusively. They never had to think of who they were. They identified with the monarchy, the subjects of the, uh, of the crown, and, of course, uh, uh, the rulers of the empire. Englishness has got all mixed up with, with the empire. It's exactly the same that the Russians c don't know who they are once the Soviet Union went. Russia was only one of 15 republics of the Soviet Union. Um, and yet, um, now the Soviet Union has gone, the Russians don't know whether they are Soviets or whether they're, they're Russians. Uh, most English people don't know whether they're English or British. I, I sat on a plane the other day with a man who said he had an English passport. And I said, you know, could, could you show me that? I, you know, it must be quite a rare historical document. And he, he, he opened it and he showed me the letters, B-R-I-T-I-S-H. And he said, there you are, English. <laughs> um, <coughs> well, spelling was never his strong point, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Andrew? Well, I was just going to say, I, doing, doing this, um, this, this television series, I was talking to a French MEP about this very subject of all things, who said made the argument in a slightly French intellectual way that there is a particular problem with any big ex-imperial power when um, the order shifts because they've defined themselves so much in terms of the external and the powerful. And it might it was the same crisis that hit Austria at the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russia, and in some respects is hitting France as well. He said it's a bit like men. Men used to be powerful and have a very clear status. And now, with the rise of feminism... Um, men are starting to ask, well, what, you know, what is it really to be a man? You know, when all these, uh, uh, the employment roles and the traditional family roles are under threat, um, the man feels hollowed out. Now, as I say, it was a slightly 
um, uh, French intellectual way of putting it, but you I can see what he meant. Too far, yeah. But still, can we move on to the nation state in the sense that um, are events overtaking us so quickly? Um, there are now 400 international companies with great clout before the First World War. There were about half a dozen or something. We know that there are, the Shell Group, for instance, has got a turnover bigger than that of Denmark. We could play these games. 400 people in the United States are worth as much as uh, the whole of the income of China. We can go on like this. Uh, are they just making, knocking the nation state down like nine pins? And are, are they the rulers? Are they the masters now, Norman? Uh, I think there is uh, a very important theme of globalisation, the power of supranational organisations. Uh, but if we're talking about these isles mainly, uh, the first things to be said is the United Kingdom is not and never has been a nation state. Uh, I think it's too late to, to turn it into one. There are many European countries or several European countries are, are very clearly nation states and will not be affected in the same way. Germany is a nation state. Uh, the best example is probably Poland, which has artificially turned into a, a nation state because of the Second World War. France is a nation state. Italy, um, rather more dubious. Spain also. I mean, it should be said that even, even these countries, however are becoming more regional at quite a fast rate. I mean, in, in Paris, they're very, very worried about the kind of conversation in the southwest between um, the Catalans and the, uh, the Languedoc and the north of Italy. Um, you know, we look at France as being completely unitary, but from Paris, it's beginning to feel not quite that way, I, certainly I, Germany. I, I absolutely agree, but I think the United Kingdom is the most vulnerable f from these outside pressures, exactly because we never got to the point of a homogenous national state. Can you describe wherein the vulnerability lies in particular? Uh, I think that because of the creation of a European community, those elements of the Isles which were never properly integrated into, into the, um, if you like, British consciousness are now uh, looking to Europe uh, as a new source of legi le legitimacy. The, the Scots Nats, uh, Andrew knows a lot they, more than they, 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 they could not have broken through without Europe. Their actually. slogan is I mean, Scotland, Scotland in Europe. Europe is very now, important to Plaid Cymru is, yeah. is Wales in Europe. Uh, soon we'll ha no doubt have the Cornish in Europe. And I, I think the north of England uh, is going to resent the uh, increasing um, domination of the south east. And we'll, we'll have uh, Cumbria and, uh, and, and Lancashire and Yorkshire well, in Europe. The north was, was a sort of uh, a very if I can use the word completely incorrectly, the phrase, a very solid state for a, for a long time. And mm. there, is, there is a strong feeling in the North that they are from, people are from the North. Yes, well, people will start... They, they, they campaign, identify themselves against London. There's now a campaign for Northern Assembly. There's mm. a campaign for Yorkshire mm. democracy, I think, headed by the Archbishop of York. I mean, there's a lot happening outside London that is very rarely reported in the London media. Mm. I still want to sort of nail... Uh, why we are particularly vulnerable to globalisation from you two. Uh, and and you, you related to the nation-state. It, couldn't it seem that maybe the centralised nation-states, such as you were talking about uh, in the European mainland, mm. are uh, more vulnerable because they're, they're unitary in a way which we aren't? Uh, why, are we going to, why are we sort of first in line to be attacked? I mean, well, the, the, the franc was attacked uh, just as powerfully as, uh, as our currency was attacked? Uh, f first of all, most of the continental states are not unitary. Uh, the German Federal Republic uh, has an extremely uh, decentralised system. Federalism, is, federalism incidentally means decentralised. This is another of this conceptual morass that we're in. The, the, all the terms are upside down. Uh, France took to regionalism uh, in the early 1980s under mm -hmm. Mitterrand and they are much um, uh, earlier and better prepared than we are with a, uh, an even regional structure which can absorb these outside pressures. So, uh, I, th I think there's one other very obvious thing which is that we are infinitely more porous um, to the world economy than most European uh, countries. A, because we possess um, both our great opportunity and our cultural threat, a world language. Um, the effect of world culture on us goes deeper and faster than it goes into France or Germany. Um, but also because we have an abnormally open uh, econo uh, e economy. We own far more of other parts of uh, the world than most other European countries, and we have much more inward investment. We are just more open, and perhaps always have been. Could I just spell that out? The, this so-called special relationship with the United States is a great threat 
to our further existence as, as we are. We are open to, um, uh, uh, if you like, globalization, supranational organizations, many of which actually uh, are coming from the United States. Why are we... Can you just spell it out a little more? Why are we... Oh, when you say open, you're, you, it seems to me that you're saying threatened. Threatened. Uh, Andrew used the word porous. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that American influences can come into this country more easily than they can uh, into, in, into most, to France. Mo- most or? people in this country were brought... A lot of people in this country were brought up with um, Winnie the Pooh, um, with a whole series of children's stories, The Jungle Book, which our children now, my children... Um, I think a character speaking with American accents. Um, they have been re-imported to us as American cartoons. And that's a tiny example of a process which is constantly happening. Um, now, I mean, I, I don't feel personally particularly threatened by it, but certainly in terms of um, Britishness, Englishness, um, it has a big, big daily effect. So are you talking about the effect on the culture or the effect on the on bo- on economy both, I presume, no? Uh, I'm more interested in culture than economy, quite. Sure. For, uh, but uh, uh, it, uh, yes, but both spheres are, are affected. Mm. Let's go back to the title of your book, The Isles. Um, um, you backed a long way off for that. It seems to me you're taking out an awful lot of insurance. Uh, not Britain, not Great Britain, nor the story of England. Uh, you you yes. mentioned Trevelyan in your opening remarks. You're talking about the Isles. You're sticking. You're sticking uh, fast to I'm the Isles. I'm sticking to it. Um, I, every chapter in the book uh, uh, has a, a different adjective added to the Isles, because I, I, I do want to um, convey the, this picture of a. Um, a constantly changing uh, situation. Uh, but it came actually from a meeting in Dublin. I, I, uh, after uh, publishing Europe, I went to Dublin, and they said, what are you writing about? And I said, well, I'm thinking about a book on the British. And there was a, a, an audible <laughs> silence. Uh, and you can't call it that anymore. Uh, the Isles ceased to be British in 1922. Uh, And they suggested, yes, you should call your book These Islands. Well, I thought that wasn't... History of These Islands wasn't... Mm. But The Isles is what I came up with. But we can't be Eilish. We can't be (laughs) Eilish. (laughs) So what do you think happening now? Are you an optimist? Do you think this... Because you talk animatedly about regionalism as if it were energising, which I think it might be, where Norman seems to think we're sort of fragmented and vulnerable. You seem to think we're breaking up, but but, uh, perhaps dynamic. Well, I, 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 I'm not a pessimist. I think that whatever's going to be, happens next is going to be fine. I'm, I'm, I'm pro-European. I don't see That's anything... That's almost to... Whatever well, happens next is well, going to be I, fine. I, I, mean, <laughs> I mean constitutionally, Melvin. I mean, I, it's, it's not going to be um, some ghastly, um, poisonous, rancorous, bitter break-up with uh, new borders erected everywhere. Um, I think that's most unlikely. But I do think that if Britain is to be held together and to be re-energised, then that is the big project. And I'm somewhat alarmed that politicians um, are so relaxed about it. You know, if you go to most politicians, certainly in government, and say, is Britain uh, OK, they'll say yes and they're wrong. Well, we have our basic text. It's Norman Davis's book, The Isles, and we'll have your series to look forward to. Um, you're talking about the, the day Britain died, so that's cheerful enough. Anyway, I enjoyed it. Hope you did. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4. The O4. The O4. The O4. The O4. The O4. The O4.